This is Scott Fain with the Team Woods Podcast, and I'm very happy today to be speaking to you with a new friend of mine here, Anthony Kirksey, a real estate investor in Ohio and Michigan. Uh, how are you doing today, Anthony? Life is good. Life is good. How are things with you? Oh, they're going excellent. Excellent. A lot of good stuff going on today. It's a nice, uh, slow Sunday, but uh, I'm happy to be here with you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> first, starting off, um, one of the how I came into contact with you is uh, through our good friend, Tina Fletcher. Uh, we did a few podcasts with her before, uh, talking a little bit about real estate and some of the stuff back in the day uh, in Youngstown and whatnot. But I want to get to know you. Um, where are you from? Uh, Youngstown, Ohio. Okay. Okay. Um, so which side of town did you grow up on? South side. Okay. South side. I, I don't know. It's north side for when I come down to visit, but I had to come and check your neighborhood out. Um did your parents own the home that you guys grew up in? Was that something that you did? Well, my mother owned her home, but my mother lived in Warren. So that's how I know Warren real estate so well. Okay. Okay. Is that where that's where you focus a lot of your energy in, Warren? Yeah, it's a it's um it's a it's almost like an easier market because mm -hmm. the lines between the haves and the have nots in Warren are very clear. Okay. So so you had some sort of a uh, home ownership kind of in your DNA with your family and whatnot. Is that? Well, yeah, because other, unlike renting, buying eventually stops. Renting mm -hmm. is perpetual. And that's one of the things I always try to explain to people. Mm -hmm. Is that what attracted you initially to investing? Like what, what's the thing that brought you to invest real estate? Well, because I learned early on that real estate is the number one creator of wealth in the history of the United States. Not minerals, not oil, gas, and that, it's real estate. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of those things that always has some value to someone. You just have to connect the dots. Who's looking for what it is that you have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of the things that I always liked about it. Um, so it's you're, you're about connecting those dots between finding the property and finding who wants that property. Right, long term. Okay. All right. Well, Tell us a little bit about uh, your most memorable deal. You know, the one that kind of still st sticks with you today. Um. Well, you know what? I think the most memorable deal I just I've done is the one I just closed. Um, I bought a house at the auction um, for one hundred eleven thousand dollars, and it had like a uh, appraised value of like two fifty two sixty. Hmm. So I'm thinking this is going to be a home run. This is going to be easy. Right. I get over there and see the house after I purchase it. Mm -hmm. And it needed everything. <laughs> like everything, total rehab. Total rehab. ripping the subfloor out because they had had like eight or ten cats and dogs. And I guess the people had died and the cats were and dogs were just left in the house. Oof. It was crazy. I mean, it was so bad people wouldn't even enter the house without wearing respirators. Oh yeah. I, oof, okay. So yeah. why did you, uh, how did that resolve itself? Like, um, are you still working on it? No, I found the sucker. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, because one of the things I try to explain to people is you got to know when to say when mm -hmm. in this business. And sometimes you don't want to throw good money after bad. So you have to know where your comfort level is. I don't normally do total rehabs because it's really hard to coordinate and find people that can do that, that won't charge you exorbitant rates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. So, so, so what I did is I dumped a few thousand dollars in it, I cleaned it out, put in a new furnace, uh, air conditioning unit, and then I sold it to someone else and let them take it the rest of the way. See, but that's cool though. I, I don't even think that's even uh, something to a sucker. When you you've cleaned it up, you know I've done that a few times. You take up a thing that needs a little bit of love because somebody that person that bought it, he might not have even looked at it if he had seen it when you got it, right? Well, well, you know what? It's funny because he was a lot of times out of state investors are your biggest headache and your biggest friend because I don't know if you're familiar with with Cleveland, but. This house was near a place called Tremont, mm -hmm. but it wasn't Tremont. Okay. So he's pulling comps based on Tremont. Mm. So okay. he's like, yeah, this place, this square footage, this many bedrooms and baths, it's got to be worth 350 And I'm sitting there like, 
okay. <laughs> Write that check. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so he's like, the most I could give you for it is like 160 and I'll pay all the fees. And this guy really thought he was getting over on me. Mm. Because he's basing his decision on Tremont. Right. So I'm like, yeah, okay, I let him talk me into it. And sometimes you just want to call back in 90 days. Like, hey, how's that working out for you? I hope it's working out well. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it, man. I get it. Um, so what's one of the biggest lessons that you learned in real estate? Um, find a system that works for you and just repeat it. Don't sometimes we all want to expand and grow and this and that. And that's sometimes that's a recipe for failure. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you got to find your niche and just master it. Mm, okay. Find your yeah. niche and master it. Yeah. I mean, because one of the, I, I, it's so funny because one of the things I noticed is like, at one point, General Motors was the largest automaker in the world. Hmm. But they lost billions of dollars every quarter. Because they were just too all over the place. Mm -hmm. At some point, you have to find what you're good at and do it. And that's it. Keep, yeah, what is it? Uh, do it, repeat, and re rinse, repeat? <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like when you play golf. The number one thing you learn when you play golf is just to have a repeatable swing. Mm-hmm. So that when you hit the ball, it'll normally go the same place that you want it to go. Right, right. You don't want to go military golf left and right every time you hit it. Yeah. Just find a swing that works for you. You're not you're not Tiger Woods. You're not going to drive it 400 yards. And just repeat it and get good at the basics. Like, I, you know, I'm to the point now I can look at a house now and just say, you know what? That's That might be a little further than I want to go. Mm-hmm. Because certain houses should be bought by people that are contractors. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. People who have that insight, because that's the only way you're going to make money off some houses. Well, well, people that can do the work themselves, because that's the number one expense in this business. No one talks about well, the, the, the subcontractor. I mean, what sub the general contractor fee. Mm -hmm. You can make decent money in this business if you just eliminate general contractors because all they're doing is calling people to come do a job for you right. you can do that yourself true yeah. so there you go depending on your bit level of uh busyness and or what kind of interest you got all over the place but like you're saying you want to follow that follow a niche follow one particular path then yes that is a good option yeah i mean if you don't do condos stay away from condos mm -hmm. if you don't have a, a client base that that you can call like every time I buy a property even before it conveys I'm working my phones my computer with people that I've done business with in the past to let them know hey this is what I have that's coming down the pipe what is your level of interest mm -hmm. you know so okay well um what five pieces of advice would you give somebody who's just now starting to get looking into getting the real estate um well the first thing I would I would say to them is understand the what what your financial situation is. Like when I first started, the first house I ever bought was seven thousand dollars, and you buy that one, and, and and once you get that first house, it just gets easier. So start small and start comfortable because you're going to make mistakes. The key is to make mistakes that you can recover from. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing I would say to people is. Don't assume that the way Joe did it is going to work for you. Get that information, listen to it, but that may not be the, the business model that works for you. Like, I don't do hard money loans. I don't. Everything I do is 100% cash because it's just real for me that way. Okay. I buy it, I buy it, I own it. If it sits six months, I don't have anybody breathing down my neck about it. True. The third thing is, I would say, is develop relationships with contractors and people that make the after purchase part of your job easier inspectors contractors real estate agents p other people that are in the business because you may not have a customer for it but somebody that you know might mm -hmm. um and the, uh, like and then i guess I, I would say the fourth thing i would say to people is this is not like an overnight success thing 
you know, it takes years to get to the point where you're making money the way you really dreamed of. It just doesn't happen overnight. And that's okay. It's a process, like I said. And then the fifth thing is um, understand what, understand opportunities when they're really coming at you. Because in this business, to be good at it, you got to make quick decisions. When you find distressed sellers that are trying to sell, you know, you may have to say yes or no to that right now with no due diligence. Mm -hmm. You know, so. Definitely helps to develop an eye for when you're looking at properties. Well, let me let me read back. Uh, I took a little notes here. I want to make sure I got them. Uh, so the five things you would recommend are understanding your financial situation. Don't assume it's going to work for you, depending on, you know, what uh, method you're choosing to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, develop relationships with your contractors and your support people, folks in the business afterwards, uh, yes. appraisers, etc. cetera. Uh, it's not going to be an overnight success. Be patient, trust the process mm -hmm. and uh, understand your opportunities so you can make quick decisions. Yes. All right. Okay. That's some good advice. I, I wish you'd been there when I'd done my first uh flip i mean i learned a lot of lessons but you know learning costs money well you know what one of the things that i tell people about real estate is that if you buy right it makes every other step in the process easier hmm. if you buy wrong it complicates every other step because then you're penny pension right yeah that's true and sometimes when you buy a house with the intent of flipping it what you're really buying is a rental because you may not be able to sell it, but you can put some a, a tenant in there and have it being a be a performing asset, mm -hmm. and then you can actually sell it for more if it's a performing asset versus a, if it's a turnkey to sit and bake it. Right, you know, because if you can say, "Hey, I'm generating X amount a month, a year, a quarter," there are people that will buy it based on the income and not the value of the property. And that's when you really get to start having fun. Hmm. Okay. It's the next level. Yeah. Uh, well, tell us a little bit about what you buy. What kind of deals do you buy? Like your price point, location, condition? Um, I don't buy in East Cleveland. Okay. That, that entire area is just off limits to me because I don't understand East Cleveland buyers. I don't understand anyone that would buy a house there because everybody I know is getting out of there as quickly as they can. Um, That's actually where I came from, East Cleveland. East Cleveland? Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, you're not there now. Case yeah. in point. Yeah. <laughs> been there many years. Other than the Rockefeller Park area, that's the only part over there that's even decent as far as I'm concerned. And the school system scores reflect that. Um, I think the other thing is, um, you know, you just have to... Like I said, just have a vision. Like when you look at a property, you should be able to say, okay, this is what this could be and, and, and get there. But yeah, it's, every property is different though. So there's like, I said, there's no real cookie cutter thing where you say, okay, I look at this percentage, this square footage, this many bedrooms. Now, in general, I don't buy anything smaller than three bedrooms hmm. because I, I, I just don't know people that are looking for one and two bedroom houses. Um, I tend to not like to buy things in HOAs because that is a that is tell a headache. It. Please tell uh, it. Please, wow, oh. why are HOAs a headache? Well, because a lot of HOAs, believe it or not, charge you transfer fees when you sell the property. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I got one over here. They charge like $1,000 for you to have the right to sell your property to somebody else. That's a lot of money. Yeah. For that. Yeah. And the other reason... I don't really like HOAs is that when you buy things at the sheriff's sale, say you buy it in January, it may not transfer until April. Mm -hmm. But that HOA is going to start charging you fees all the way back to January, even though you weren't the legal owner. Yep. So, yeah, I mean, I just, I just, I try not to deal with things that add complications because those are not complications that you can normally solve through conversation. Mm -hmm. That normally resolves going to court because they're, they're very adamant about, hey, you're going to pay us this, but we're going to put a lien on your property and you can't sell it. Hmm. 
Yeah, that's what I've had experiences with them. It hasn't been to that degree. Most of it's been like if you buy a property and there's a, you know, if you're not ready to work on it immediately or do something to it, you know, you just, okay, I'm going to sit this for a second. And then you start getting hit with fees. Oh, make sure the grass is this, make sure it's that, even if it had been sitting for years. Right. But, but because they understand that they can't get that money from the previous owner, but they can get it from you. Right. So They're very aggressive. with it. <laughs> oh man. Yes, they are. Um, yeah. So I don't deal with that. The other thing, I don't know if if you're familiar with uh, Cleveland. We have a thing up here called point of sale. I'm not familiar with it. Okay. A point of sale inspection is here in Cleveland and all the the, the suburban areas. They have a thing where the city has to inspect it before you can transfer the deed. Okay. So say you have a Shaker Heights is a perfect example. Say you have a house in Shaker that's $100,000 and the city comes out and says, okay, it needs $50,000 of repair. The person buying that house has to give the city of Shaker $75,000 to hold an escrow until they make those $50,000 in repairs. Goodness. And that's what keeps a lot of cash buyers out of Shaker. Maybe that's the point. You know, yeah. the cash buyers are in Shaker. Well, so, but the problem with that, though, is then what you end up with is a lot of houses that are, are below a certain standard, but that person can't sell it because of the point of sale thing. So it just sits and decays over time. Yeah, I've seen uh, my uh, family. I got family in Shaker. Uh, that was one of the property. There was a property down the street from them, and I looked at once upon a time and there's a lot of nice houses there but if there's something going on with you i can see why the, some of the style hasn't really shifted and moved forward at all because it mm -hmm. seems like it might be too much type too expensive yeah i mean like they'll like you might be looking at a house and the city comes out and says okay you got to put in a new driveway that's ten thousand dollars yeah easy yeah and we're not gonna get into tuck pointing and roofing i mean it, it shaker is one of those places you got to have deep pockets okay so uh, as far as like what you're looking for, um, what I'm hearing is you don't have a set area. If the deal makes sense. Oh yeah. I, yeah, for the for the right price, I buy stuff I don't even like. Okay. okay. Because some somebody else will. Okay. Um, okay. So then it's just a matter of finding deals that work for you. Deals over three three uh, bedrooms mm -hmm. in eastern areas with uh, uh, what condition? You said you don't like doing rehabs. So what? Well, 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 I don't like doing complete guts. Okay. I don't I don't mind doing like a mid level to a low level refresh or a rehab. If I'm putting in some flooring, painting, windows, you know, whatever. Mostly cosmetic. Yeah. But when you get to the point where you're doing like uh structural issues, you got a fleet of water in the basement, um, you gotta put a new roof on something, you gotta put twenty windows in a house. I mean, that's when this stuff gets expensive quick. Okay. All right. Um, well, what kind of deals do you have available right now? Well, you know, I bought a, I just bought two houses in Warren. Um, one is on, off of Highland Avenue, lovely three bedroom, one bath, two lots, nice garage. That one um, will be available like on the first. I bought one over on um, Meadowbrook by, uh, I guess it used to be called St. Joe's or Warren General or whatever the hospital is over there now. And it's got a brand new, like $20,000 metal roof on it. That's the only reason I bought it. Cause it's the first house I've had with a metal roof. Yeah. So it's like four bedroom, one bath. No, nah, I think it's like two baths. Nice attached garage, corner lot. Um, so that ought to, that ought to go well, do well. So you already have it priced out for what you're going to sell it for. Well, yeah, okay, so so in the, in the spirit of transparency, I'll, I'll, I'll share this with you. Um, like the Metal Brook house I bought, let's just say I bought it for $35,000. Um, okay. It was somewhere around there. I could sell that tomorrow without spending a dollar on it for seventy, hmm. because it's a $120,000 retail kind of house. Okay. So a lot of times that's what I'll do. I call that a turn and burn. Yeah. 35, 70. That's a good day at the office, $35,000. And I didn't have to do anything except write a check. Mm -hmm. The other house I bought off of Highland Avenue, I paid like $4,000 for. Now, that is a rental dream because a three bedroom, one bath over there, you can rent for six fifty dollars a month. Mm. So you can, you can get, you can get yeah. your money back in the first year. Exactly. And that 
those are the deals that I look for. Okay. Um, so yeah, okay, yeah. So that you answered my next question, which is what kind of deals you're currently looking for. So yeah, stuff that you can do like that with. Um, yeah, I'm. Mm -hmm. I guess somewhat of the the when it comes to that, like the 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 owner becomes a a thing. Uh, what kind of owners, uh, people that what kind of because we used to call them don't wanters when mm -hmm. I was in um, school for uh, real estate. A don't wanter, somebody who for whatever reason could be death, could be divorce, could be whatever. Uh, they don't want the property anymore. And those are the, the people that you're trying to find, people that you're looking for. Well, here's the thing. And and I say this with, like I say, with full transparency. I have never in almost 20 years in this business bought a property from an individual. Mm -hmm. Ever. Hmm. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even know how, what that looks like. I buy 100% of my properties either from government entities or at foreclose bank foreclosures tax foreclosures okay so that's okay so you're you're doing it that way i i've, I've always done it the other way i've only well that will say only because we have bought from that type of thing before but primarily from person to person yeah see to me that add like, once again to me that adds some layers to it because for to that person selling it's personal because it's their house mm -hmm. whereas if i'm buying it from the sheriff sale they don't care about the house and i don't either okay okay well that's we a good have, yeah and the good thing about getting it from the government is that it re automatically removes any encumbrances that are attached with the property mm -hmm. because they serve everybody a notice. Hey, this property is going to foreclosure. If you want it, write us a check. And once they don't write that check, because they never do, then their claim to that property goes away. Okay. It's like one of the things I try to explain to people is tax liens overpower everything even mortgages. Yeah. Yeah. So you might have a house and this is something that just happened. Actually, you may have about a 200 and something thousand dollar house in um, Cleveland. This guy had a mortgage on it. This lady had a mortgage on it, but she also had $70,000 in back taxes. So hmm. when I buy the taxes, the County of Cuyahoga tells the bank to kick rocks. Hmm. The mortgage just goes away. Man. Let's be nice, be nice to be the bank. Wait, well, well not, not the bank. You don't I mean, want sure, to be the, the bank. bank. The government. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the wrong person. Yeah, it's, it like a, it's like the food chain. Cuyahoga County outranks Huntington National Bank. Because <laughs> for Huntington to protect their interest in that property, they would have had to come to the auction just like me and bid. And they weren't willing to throw more money after what they'd already were going to stand in it to lose. So they just write it off. Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I know we don't have a whole lot of uh, time this morning for a more in-depth uh, discussion, but I, I would like to ask you one more question before we uh, take a dip for, okay. for the day at least. Um, what was the very first album, musical album that you ever purchased with your very own money. Oh, that would have had to have been like Thriller. Ooh, first time I've ever heard that answer. <laughs> what? People was buying albums before Thriller? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, that's the first time I've heard that answer. Good answer, too. Yeah. Good answer. I mean, I'm all about value. I want to get an album with as many good songs on it as possible. You could play that one from beginning to end and repeat. I love you that. You could do that, and you could do that today. <laughs> Yes, that's yeah. the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. that, that's the thing about I say to people all the time. That's the thing I love about real estate is that it endures. I can look at a hundred year old house and you can see the craftsmanship and the care mm -hmm. that went into building that. And to me, I, I prefer that a lot of times to these new cookie cutter houses that these firms are just throwing up in, in, in 90 days. Yeah, on a lot. that's one of the yeah. reasons I like East Cleveland, even though you uh, kind of down on the area. When you go through there, it's sad because there's so many beautiful buildings that were built, you know, back when they were really taking their time to build them. And they're all like in disrepair and falling apart. But I would love to go back in there and, and take those buildings back and make bring them back to glory because they're, glor well, they're you glorious. Know, well, you know, what? it's funny. East Cleveland, in a lot of ways, r reminds me of Detroit. Mm -hmm. The difference is, at least in Detroit, the powers that be came up with a plan. East Cleveland doesn't have a plan. Hmm. 
And that's why it just continuously just gets worse. Because all the people that can help make your situation in your city better are leaving. Hmm. Because they, they don't feel safe, their kids can't get good educations, and there are no amenities. Yeah. You're you speaking know, truth. you definitely yeah. speaking truth. So, there it is. And there it is. Uh, I've seen houses selling in East Cleveland two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000. And this is what's so crazy about it. Nobody bid on them. Yeah, because there's what do you have to... I mean, I, I get it. I would love to do it, but you it would take deep pockets and a commitment to really making some things happen over there. And how many times is the place going to get vandalized and broken into while you're trying to rehab it? That's a yeah, that's a whole other thing. But yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just on strictly the real estate part alone, it just requires a lot of commitment. And uh before you even get into just the dealing with the folks and, and whatnot. But uh, anyway, I appreciate you taking the time with me today. Um, I feel like we could dip into different corners and, and have some uh, other kinds of conversations as well. Um, but we'll save that for another time. Yes, but, sir. Uh, thank you again. Thank you.